What's going on everybody? Jason here from The Comprehensive Dentist. And today we're gonna to talk about what to do if you see a deep carious lesion on a tooth. So today one of my students came to me and they were on operative rotation. And they were specifically gonna treat this patient here and the patient had a curious lesion identified on the distal of tooth number four. And it's a little hard to make out on this specific radiograph, but you can see it there. It kind of looks like it originates from the occlusal and then it extends down into the tooth. It kind of hugs that distal DEJ. And so the, the resident was talking about how, you know, okay, what if I'm, removing the caries and I potentially get a pulp exposure. And so we had a conversation about, okay, what kind of things do you need to think about if you're gonna treat a tooth that has a carious lesion that extends pretty far into the dentin. So if I had the same case, some of the things I would think about doing would be, um, I'd wanna do pulp sensibility tests, okay? And basically that would entail at least doing cold test, all right, on that tooth. Because you want to get a baseline, uh, basically a baseline pulpal diagnosis, but then you also want to get a periapical diagnosis as well. But for the cold test, you're going to be testing specifically the pulpal, right, tissue. So test the pulpal tissue with the endoice. And if it's responsive and it doesn't linger, then that's usually a good sign. That's a sign of reversible pulpitis. If it is responsive and it does linger, well, that's not a good sign because that could be irreversible pulpitis, which means the tooth probably needs a root canal. Or if the tooth doesn't respond at all, now you're dealing with a, a necrotic tooth that actually potentially needs root canal or extraction. So, do the pulp sensibility test. That gives you an idea if endo needs to be on or off the table for treatment options. The other thing I would do is always have a bite wing and have a periapical radiograph available. You want to be able to use the bite wing to visualize kind of where the caries is uh, coronal apically. Okay. You want to be able to see if in some situations, if it's on the interproximal area, how deep that caries goes and how close it is to the, the alveolar bone level. Because that would give you some indication too if you know potentially crown lengthening would be necessary or if you're going to be removing caries down subgingival. Now the periapical is good because it gives you a lot of information about the periradicular tissue. That allows you to adequately assess if the lamina dura around the tooth is intact. Um, is there a periapical radiolucency present or is there not? So that in itself is really good for helping you with your periapical diagnosis. You know, a tooth like this would have a diagnosis of caries, but I would also expect the resident or any of my students to give me a pulpal diagnosis as well and a periapical diagnosis. So in this specific situation, the student actually tested the tooth. So the diagnosis was occlusal uh, caries and the pulpal diagnosis was reversible pulpitis because it did respond to cold, it did not linger. And the periapical diagnosis, based off a of sensitivity test, um, such as like um, tapping on the tooth, percussion, or palpation, and using those things in conjunction with the periapical, they determined that the periapical diagnosis was normal. Okay, so you have your pulp sensibility test, you, you get your bite wing, your PA, now, you know, use all that information, determine your pulpal diagnosis, determine your periradicular diagnosis. Next, you have to determine restorability, okay? So how do you do that? Well, I can tell you right now that you cannot always determine restorability by looking at a tooth clinically or by just looking at the radiograph. In many situations, you're going to have to actually excavate the caries, remove all the existing restorations, any undermined tissue or any undermined tooth structure, and then assess that tooth as a whole, okay? So that's very important 
because you can't really determine how much tooth structure you have left until the caries is removed, until the existing restorations are removed. So, you know, in some situations, you can kind of visualize what a tooth would look like after those things are done. In other situations, you're just not going to know for sure. So you got to do that. You know, and one thing I always like to do is, you know, determine will this tooth need a crown or will it not need a crown? And you know, there's different criteria to determine that. Um, typically, if, you know, I'm encroaching up on a cusp tip uh, with my caries removal, I'm definitely thinking about capping that cusp or doing a cuspal coverage restoration there. And you have multiple options available. But if for some reason now we're, we're potentially encroaching on multiple cusps, then a lot of times it makes sense to do a complete cuspal coverage, full coverage crown or onlay in some situations. So if you're going to do something like that, you're going to go down the road of putting a crown on a tooth like this, then I think that needs to be factored into your restorability, right? Because if you have a deep curious lesion and it's very close to the pulp, but the tooth is vital, well, if you're going to put a crown on that tooth, then you really need to think hard about whether or not you need to do an endodontic procedure, whether it be elective or whether you just monitor the tooth for a little while and then actually reassess it at a later date. So let's talk about two different scenarios. So scenario one, we determine that due to the size of the caries and the fact that number four has not had a large restoration placed in the past, that it will not need a crown after we remove the caries. So if there's no crown needed and you have a deep curious lesion, you have a few options available. You could do a complete caries removal, meaning that you go in there and you remove all the caries and you work your way down to sound dentin and sound enamel. Now the risk of that in some of these lesions is you could potentially have a pulp exposure. And so you kind of have to decide, okay, how deep is deep enough, right? And you have to determine by kind of gauging your radiographs and, and using your, your clinical measurements, knowing how long your burrs are, that sort of thing, to determine if you're close to the pulp or you're not close to the pulp. If you think you can remove all the caries and not have a pulp exposure, then chances are complete caries removal is the way to go. However, if you are worried that you will not be able to move, remove all the caries without having a pulp exposure, and again, we're talking about a vital tooth here. If you're worried about that, then you may need to think about either a partial caries removal where you remove all the caries circumferentially around the prep and then you leave some caries on the pulpal floor. So that would involve obviously leaving some caries there, but you place a liner such as like calcium hydroxide, maybe a vitrobond layer over top of that. Calcium hydroxide will help encourage the tooth to have tertiary dentin formation. It will allow the tooth to strengthen up from the fluoride release of the vitrobond. But nonetheless, you're placing a liner over that caries that you left, and then you're placing a definitive restoration. And if it's well sealed and the margins are very well sealed, you're not going to have ongoing leakage of that restoration. You're going to actually arrest that caries that you left underneath that restoration. So that's partial caries removal. Your third option would be stepwise caries removal, meaning that you remove as much caries as you can, you leave some caries on the floor, and then you either place a liner or you place a temporary restoration in that tooth and you allow the patient to function on that tooth for three to six months and then you bring them back at a later date and you actually remove the temporary and you remove the remaining caries if it's still you know soft or if it's still able to be removed if it's you know basically um, if it's hardened if it's arrested i wouldn't really remove it in those situations but stepwise caries removal always requires two visits at a minimum and then you place your final restoration in the tooth at that time and there's a lot of discussion on what type of materials you can use for temporary restorations. Um, if, 
it's going to be a tooth that doesn't require a crown, then most likely I would still want to put something kind of strong in there. My choice would be some type of RMGI like Fuji 2LC. Or I would actually use, maybe you could just use Amalgam, right? Uh, so there's a lot of options that you could choose. Even if you want to place Cavid or like IRM. You know, I don't really love those as options. Um, but if you thought it was well sealed, it wasn't in an area that had heavy occlusal forces, perhaps that could be a choice, but it wouldn't be my first choice. Now, partial caries removal and stepwise caries removal, you're essentially doing an indirect pulp cap in those situations. You're placing a liner over that residual caries or that remaining caries on that pulpal floor with the intent of trying to remineralize that and prevent that actual pulp tissue from having further issues or becoming irreversible pulpitis or necrotic. So those are the options that I would think about if the tooth is vital and it does not need a crown, okay? Now, let's say that by looking at this tooth, we know that the caries is going to take up the majority of the occlusal table and it's going to most likely require some type of crown or cuspal coverage restoration. So now, what kind of things do you need to think about? Well, if you're going to crown a tooth, you really need to have a feral effect on that tooth. Feral essentially means that your crown is going to engage a part of that tooth structure, that residual tooth structure, at some point, okay, on that preparation. You may have a core buildup present, but your crown should engage ideally two millimeters of tooth structure inferior or below that actual core buildup material. And feral helps obviously allow any lateral forces that are placed on that crown to be transmitted to the tooth in more of a favorable um, kind of way, right? So feral is really designed to kind of protect the tooth from future issues, fracture, loosening of the crown, leakage, etc. So if you don't have feral present, if you think when you prep the tooth you're not going to have two millimeters of solid tooth structure to place that crown on, then you have to create it somehow. Right? That may be a situation where you need to think about a crown lengthening procedure to expose more of that tooth structure so you can actually have tooth structure to engage that crown on now. Or perhaps you need to think about ortho extrusion where you actually pull the tooth out of its socket into the mouth more. And it may also require a combination of ortho extrusion and crown lengthening to expose more of that tooth. So that's a, something that's very important to think about is do you have feral? And do you need crown lengthening? Is the carry so deep and close to that alveolar crest below the gingiva that now to get your margin where you need it to be below your restorative material, you're actually going to be having a biologic width invasion. You're going to be too deep into the tissue, potentially creating some periodontal issues, inflammation, swelling, bleeding, etc. So that's things you need to think about as well. Now the other thing is if the tooth is going to get a crown and it has a deep carious lesion present, now you really need to think about do I need to just go ahead and do the endo? Even though the tooth is vital, should I go ahead and actually pulp the tooth, do a pulpectomy, initiate the root canal? In a lot of ways that can make a, a lot of sense, especially if the patient's having some mild symptoms that are suggestive of irreversible pulpitis or things kind of going south down the road. It may not be a bad idea in those situations to go ahead and think about elective endo. Now, in some situations too, you may just say, you know what, the tooth needs a crown, but we're going to play the waiting game. I'm going to try to maintain the vitality of this tooth and we'll give it a few months. That's fine too, right? You don't always have to put the crown on right away, but you do need to make sure whatever core material you place is strong enough and that the remaining tooth structure around that is not weakened to where the patient may accidentally bite down one day and actually fracture that tooth. Another thing you need to think about, especially if you're thinking about potentially doing endo on this tooth, is does the tooth need a post and core? And a lot of times that's another conversation in and of itself because depending on what criteria you actually use to determine if you're going to place a post or not, may kind of sway you one way or the other. Now I can tell you 
the function of the post is ideally always to retain the core. So if the majority of your core material doesn't have any way to be retained in the tooth, then it makes sense to do a post in those situations. Regardless of whether or not you do a post or not, you still need to have ferrule present, ideally one to two millimeters. And the other thing too, if you're, if you're gonna place a crown on a tooth like this too, that's got a deep curious lesion, you know, what type of prosthesis are you thinking? Are you thinking about an Emax crown, all ceramic? Are you thinking about zirconia? Are you thinking about a PFM, gold? See where I'm going with this. And if you're using any of those options, are you going to actually bond the restoration in using a resin cement and actually bond that to the tooth? Or are you thinking about conventional cementation, maybe using a glass ionomer or resin modified glass ionomer cement to actually cement that crown? And then if it's endo treated, what about the option of an endo crown, right? Where you use the core to actually retain part of that crown and you use more of an internal ferrule. You just do a cuspal coverage um, reduction or a clusal reduction of about 1.5 to 2 millimeters and actually bond that restoration to the tooth. Now, typically in a situation like this, if it was number four, you got to be a little careful about endocrine because that pulp chamber is not as big and bulky as it would be on like a maxillary or mandibular molar. So endocrines on premolars should be used cautiously. And then the other thing is, in line with what type of prosthesis you're going to use, is there any specific strengths, uh, you know, scenarios that you need to come into play? Is the patient a grinder? Do they have visible signs of wear? Do they have wear facets on their teeth? Do they have a history of bruxism or report that they grind their teeth? You know, in those situations, you may want to go with something a little bit stronger that could also influence how you restore that tooth. And then big picture considerations as well. You know, is this the only tooth that's going to require a crown in their mouth? If this is going to be potentially a bigger case where you're going to have multiple teeth that are going to be restored, sometimes you got to think about the big picture options at that time. Not just get so much tunnel vision that you're focusing on this tooth number four, what's going on with the other teeth in the mouth as well. That may also influence your decision on what type of prosthesis you're going to use. So those are some of the things I actually think about if I'm going to treat a tooth, even something as simple as this where you know it looks like it's just a simple operative procedure. When the caries extends deep into the tooth, now you're, you're getting into a realm of potentially endo, perio, you know, if you need to do crown lengthening, and you know, thinking about your, your simple pros uh, needs as well if you're going to have to actually crown this tooth. So you really need to walk through those kind of thought processes every time you encounter something like this and just have a logical way of thinking about things. And the way I like to do it is crown or no crown, and then based off of that decision, I kind of think about other individual things that we discuss. All right, so if you have any questions, leave them in the comments down below, or if you wanna make a comment about the video, I'd love to hear your response and what kind of things you do to help you in these situations. But um, good luck treating these cases, they can be tough, but they're very important that you understand how to go through this step process and this thought process so the patient can have the best care possible.